everyone. Um, sorry for that brief technical uh, interlude. Um, I'd like to introduce Ben Schrader, who is an urban historian and has uh, recently published a book, which I'm afraid in the technical interlude, the title is out of my mind. Oh, sorry, it's called Big Smoke. The Big Smoke, which has been very successful and we've all enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. Um, he's also working on a Marsden-funded evictions project um, here in the Department of Public Health, although his main role as a, is as a public historian. Um, but he's looking at evictions culture and the development of an evictions culture and the lived experience of evictions in New Zealand history as part of that project. Um, I'd like to hand over to him now for an overview of the national-led government's housing policies, which I'm sure we will all find fascinating, if not, if somewhat disheartening. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Tēnā koutou. Um, it's lovely to be here and um, have you come along um, <coughs> this lunchtime. Um, this is my role as a public historian. I was asked last year to, by um, Professor Stephen Levine at the Politics Department at Victoria Uni um, to write an overview of national housing policy um, during their tenure in government. Um, every election that department puts out a book about the election um, and they invite particular um, people to come and uh, write about aspects of that election and they wanted me to write about housing. So this is drawn from um, the book chapter which is coming out later this year. I'm very much aware that there's many in this room that have particular expertise um, in housing and in some ways will know about some of these issues more than I do. Um, and in some ways too, uh, because it's an overview, it is a bit of a once over likely in aspects of that, but I'm hoping in discussion time we could perhaps get into some more detail about some of the issues that interest you. Okay. <clears throat> Well, in a 2007 speech, the National Party leader, John Key, identified a housing crisis in New Zealand. He subsequently never mentioned the housing crisis again, but um, he did in 2007. He said that under the incumbent Labour government, um, housing had become more unaffordable and home ownership rates had plummeted. And that's especially in the um, demographic of people in the ages between 20 and 40. Um, he put it down to, on demand side, house prices had doubled since 2001, um, excluding many first-time house buyers. And he said, um, we have to turn that around. On the supply side, he said that too few houses were being built, especially in Auckland. And he said, we need to increase housing supply. So there were two main points that I um, thought arose from the speech. The first one was a reassertion of National's conviction that um, home ownership provided New Zealanders with a stake in the soil, um, an economic stake in the soil, and should be within reach of young and prudent. So this idea that um, New Zealanders growing up in New Zealand could, um, once they got to their 20s, be able to reach that ideal of home ownership, sometimes called the New Zealand dream. Um, and the second thing that um, raised for me was that the a conviction that the contention really that the housing crisis was primarily an issue of insufficient supply and that increasing housing supply would solve the affordability problem um, and as we'll see through the course of this um, talk that wasn't that simple um, so I just that that cover comes from um, a state advances corporation pamphlet from the 1950s and it was given out to all state housing tenants um, at that time with the idea that um, state housing tenants would want to buy their house. And they offered very um, generous terms like 3% mortgage over 40 years and um, was very much a gift to those that were living there. So in terms of housing policy, historically, national-led governments have tended to sell state houses and labour-led governments have built them. Now, the side of difference between um, Labour and Nationals policy was very much um, a place called Hobsonville Point um, in Auckland. Now, that had been a former Air Force base, and in the early 2000s, the incumbent Labour government said, um, well, it was surplus requirements, and they should turn it into housing. So they created what they called the Hobsonville Land Company, which is a subsidiary of Housing New Zealand, um, in an effort to build thousands of new state houses of which 15% would be affordable 
and 15% would be state housing. So it was one way of Labour responding to solve Auckland's housing crisis. Um, but Key, whose um, electorate Hobsonville was in, uh, funnily enough, called it economic vandalism to build state houses in the area of where land um, was so um, was so uh, it was so such premium value. Um, but he didn't oppose building uh, affordable housing there. Um, and so for Key, for Key, Hobsonville represented the difference between National and Labour's policies. National's aim was to what he called turbocharge supply by reducing the constraints. So things like urban land and land limits, um, consenting processes, things like the Resource Management Act, um, that hindered private sector housing provision. And Labour's element, uh, on the other hand, Labour's answer was to build more state houses themselves, or, or houses, affordable housing. So Key promised to continue Hobsonville without the state houses, but he wouldn't start similar initiatives um, elsewhere. He was very much of the belief that if the housing problem was going to be solved, then it needed to be led by the private sector. So um, National was swept to power in the end, um, end of 2008. It formed a coalition government with ACT, the Māori Party, um, United Future, but also under a memorandum of, had a memorandum of understanding with the Green Party. Um, and under that understanding, um, national government agreed to support the Warm Up New Zealand Healthy Homes initiatives, which many of you will be familiar, or if not worked on, um, in this uh, particular institution. Um, so the state would subsidise the retrofitting of, um, of, of uh, insulation and or install clean heating in pre-2000 houses. Um, and this would lead to improved health, health outcomes for occupiers. And of course, much of the research that was done in the public health department here informed um, this particular policy. Well, it proved to be a real success story. By 2016, some nearly 300,000 homes had been insulated. Um, again, as some of you know, the policies changed um, over the years and it's now not as freely available as it was when it was uh, initiated. Um, but the, hopefully with the present government, it will continue. Um, other policies included the Welcome Home Loan Mortgage Insurance Scheme, Gateway Housing Initiative, and designing what became the Kiwi Home Start Grant, um, the logo of, logo of which is at the bottom there. So that was a way of using your Kiwi savers, um, savings to put um, a deposit um, on, on your uh, uh, first home. The other thing they did, of course, was to resume the selling of state houses, um, particularly the standalone ones. Um, the other thing the national government was keen to do was state housing reform. Um, in February 2010, it created the Housing Shareholders Advisory Group to examine how state housing might be better utilised. And so it got groups from various stakeholders, including business leaders, including people involved in social housing, um, and others to study, um, study state housing and how, how its multi-billion dollar asset could be better utilised. So very quickly it came away with a few um, number of key recommendations. Um, the first of all was, was growing the community housing sector rather than increasing state housing. Um, this idea that um, whereas in other countries they had a large community housing sector that was still very small in New Zealand and it had the ambition to grow, grow um, community housing providers to, um, create, uh, uh, to create more competition in the social housing market. The other thing was to transfer some state housing to the community housing sector and extend rental subsidies to such providers. So things like income, income related rents are across to them. And also combining state housing provision to those with most need, um, introducing renewable tenancies that those of less need would move on. So um, define that convention that a state house is there for life, that state housing should really just be for those with most need, um, and those that didn't have that need should uh, be encouraged to move into the private rental housing sector. Uh, and that's the cover of the report. So um, a 2013 amendment to the Social Housing Reform Act extended income-related rents and to community housing providers and introduced a tenancy review process um, to end the State House for Life Convention. Um, state housing tenancy provision was transferred from Housing New Zealand to the Ministry of Social Development 
um, on the basis that um, the Ministry for Social Development um, were better provide, able to provide the wraparound social services that many state housing tenants needed, um, which did kind of make sense. Um, a 2015 amendment to the Act provided for the transfer of some state housing to community housing providers um, to foster more diverse social housing ownership and create a competitive social housing market. So the three main things, and among those people who were affected was um, Vladimir and Tatiana, um, who lived in a state house in Seatoon. They'd come to New Zealand in 1998 as political refugees. Um, having lived there for 18 years, they had a renewable tenancy review, and they were told they were no longer permitted to live there. Um, and that's a, a Dominion Post photograph of them looking a bit sad about it all. Um, so National also believed that state housing suburbs had become too socially homogenous. Um, saw them as filled with people of disadvantaged people with complex social needs. Um, when state housing first got established, it was very much the case that they were socially mixed communities, but as state housing provision became more and more um, uh, confined to those um, with that, that had um, a particular social disadvantage, they became more socially homogenous. Um, and so the Nats thought that better social outcomes could be uh, afforded by delivering um, or rebuilding these areas as mixed tenure communities, um, comprising social and private housing, both rental and freehold. Um, now, so under this um, public-private partnership model, um, state housing would comprise no more than 15% in any given area. So in areas like um, Nainai here in Wellington, um, or Tamaki, um, Glen Innes in Auckland, which had been built as state housing communities, that re re rebuilt as, as mixed, mixed tenure communities where state housing would only be 15% of the total. And Glen Innes was the first renewal scheme. Um, and this photograph was taken when I was writing the state housing book. Um, this was at Talbot Park in the middle of Glen Innes, and all those houses have subsequently gone. Now, Glen Innes was the first um, area to be um, redeveloped and it caused a number of protests from tenants. Um, they talked about it being economic cleansing and they created what they called the Tamaki Housing Group to fight the scheme. Um, a flashpoint was um, the relocation of some houses to a Kataya a Papakainga scheme in Northland, um, leading to a charge that um, of taking from the poor to give to the poor. So the idea was that um, uh, the community in Northland came together seeing that these houses were surplus to requirements. They thought the better idea was then to remove them up to Northland and use them as um, uh, iwi housing or haku housing, whānau housing. Um, but that created resistance from the people that were living in these houses and they said, um, uh, they said that this wasn't fair. Um, there was a series of pickets and scuffles. Um, it created really bad publicity for the government, um, and subsequently they stopped the houses and removals and just demolished them instead. So in terms of sustainability issues, that wasn't a great outcome. <clears throat> um, so here we've got Betty, um, who was in the film A Place to Called Home, which is a documentary about the removals, and also a picket um, about a house being removed. Famously, Honi Harawera was erect, uh, arrested during one of these protests. So in 2013, the government and Auckland City Council formed the Tamaki, um, uh, Tamaki Regeneration Company to oversee the transformation of not only Glen Innes, but also Point England and parts of Panmure. Um, ownership of all housing New Zealand houses in the area were transferred to the TRC in 2016. Um, having learnt from the Glen Innes protest, the government promised that they'd maintain the existing number of social housing units, um, and uh, so um, th there'll be more intensification of housing, but the number of units would stay the same. But the other thing that, of course, happened there um, is that there was also an economic transfer and a power transfer there. So whereas these communities um, had been largely working class people of large proportions of Pacific and Māori communities, um, you tended to get more um, middle class people moving in, into these redeveloped areas. I mean, the houses were 800,000 plus, many of them. 
Um, so that changing the social demography of the area as well. So I think one of the issues we're trying to deal with now is how um, people living in the state housing areas can still be empowered within their own communities. Um, but it's a mixed issue. So a similar scheme was carried out in Northcote in Auckland, Pomaru here in Wellington, and Marae Nui in Napier. The other issue that was um, confronting the government was the issue of housing affordability. By 2012, um, Auckland houses were costing six, uh, six to seven times the median household income, where the standard definition for an affordable house was three times. The previous government had introduced what it called the Affordable Housing Act in 28, and the idea was that with any new developments, there had to be a proportion of um, affordable housing. Um, whether that be social housing or um, market housing. Um, but National saw that as being too interventionist and interfering in private property rights and repealed it. So by 2011, the government then asked the Productivity Commission to investigate factors affecting housing affordability. It found that urban land limits, the limit around um, cities where you cannot build um, housing, was a major constraint on housing supply and that they should be relaxed to increase, um, to increase that supply. They also recommend that, that building consent process be streamlined to reduce costs and building construction productivity improved. One of the issues they identified in terms of productivity is that New Zealand culturally had the idea of um, we like to build what they call bespoke houses, um, individually designed houses, and they're much more expensive than building, say, um, prefabricated houses with one design or a few designs. Um, and so they were looking at ways of improving that. And the other thing they said that, you know, builders often would only build one or two houses a year compared to overseas where they build many more. Um, advised against changing the tax structure on housing or reforming the rental housing sector. So it decided it didn't want to bring in things like to dampen the demand like a capital gains tax or review the rental housing sector to make it more um, appealing for those that have to deal with it. They thought that once affordable, more affordable housing came on, then um, other houses would trickle down to renters and then they'd move into um, better housing. So um, the Productivity Commission's report reinforced National's view that um, sluggish land supply and red tape was impeding affordable housing. Um, they measures to dampen housing demand they didn't take, nor did the government consider interventions like buying land for housing and building housings for sale. Um, and we often thought of the national government as something as, as championing private enterprise, but in fact in the 1950s they were very strongly involved in housing provision. And one of the things they did was to develop what they called the group um, housing scheme where they encouraged private builders to buy houses and if they didn't sell them then the state would buy them. So that gave builders security in terms of building houses and that they could invest in it and it really um, ended the post-war housing crisis in New Zealand. Uh, it led to homes, that, um, organisations such as Neil Homes and Keith Hay Homes, um, which provided houses in New Zealand in the, up to the 70s and 80s. Instead, National promised to increase um, housing land supply, reform the Resource Management Act um, to reduce all those planning delays, improve infrastructure provision, and that would also increase um, construction productivity through improved processes. Well, the other thing that happened around this time was the Christchurch earthquake, um, well, the Canterbury earthquakes in 2010 and 2011. The 2011 one was the most damaging one, um, destroyed or damaged thousands of houses and displaced thousands of Cantabrians. The resultant um, housing shortage led to a big spike in rents, and as some of you will recall, a lot of people were living in um, garages and tents and things. Um, Tenancy Protection Association in Christchurch called the government to put in rent controls to make rents affordable because they weren't affordable. The government refused, saying that um, it wouldn't intervene and that the issue was best left to the market. Um, the market, they said, would also solve the city's housing shortage. Um, and here's a damaged house, state house in um, Heathcote Valley. Um, so the market-led approach characterised Christchurch's rebuilding. Um, in early 2012, a popular vision emerged of Christchurch. Again, some of you might remember that a lot of community activities in terms of shared visions of how the city should develop, and generally agreed that we should have a more compact and environmentally sustainable city. 
The central city would be redeveloped um, by building more medium density housing, encouraging consolidation in brownfield sites. And you can see in these two images um, here, this is the east frame, which um, with Manchester Street running along the right hand corner um, in the bottom image, um, Latimer Square, that tree lined park area, um, all the buildings have been demolished. And the vision was to create um, something like that um, above with medium density housing. Um, but private um, enterprise resisted this vision. Um, they had no experience of building really medium density housing and wanted to do what it knew best, and that was building suburban housing on the urban periphery on greenfield sites. Um, so that led critics to allege that rather than building a 21st century city, sustainable city, that um, builders had just um, rebuilt a 20th century city, um, as it was. For um, by 2017, the housing shortage was over, and the government argued that the market had delivered. So this is the type of housing that occurred on um, the western, particularly the western periphery of Christchurch. Um, that vision of, <laughs> of sustainable um, ability was somewhat compromised. It's very much reliant on usual car, automobile, suburb. Um, it's, uh, there's very little public transport out there as well. Um, the good news, I guess, is I was down there a few months ago and there are new, renewed efforts to be building more medium density housing in the central city, that's the beginning. Um, I guess if the market solved um, Christchurch problems, um, it, um, approving, you know, solving Auckland's problems proved harder. Um, in 2013, um, the Auckland City Council and the government um, created what they called the Auckland, um, the Auckland Housing Accord and pledged to build close to 40,000 dwellings over three years. Um, because the RMA had hit obstacles in Parliament, um, it hadn't been reformed, they decided to introduce what they called special housing areas, whereby um, uh, areas that were proclaimed as these could fast track housing consent processes. Um, and the idea that then that would increase affordable housing supply. So in Auckland, there are 154 housing um, areas declared. 32% were on brownfield sites in the existing city, um, but a huge 68% um, were on peri-urban sites or greening field sites. Um, and this got into conflict with the unitary plan, the draft unitary plan, because the draft unitary plan, which the Auckland City Council was developing at that time, was very much about urban consolidation of containing the city, of encouraging, again, a sustainable city based on public transport and those sorts of things. The government decided um, that wasn't the New Zealand way. Um, the New Zealand way was to keep building burbs. <clears throat> and here we have Len Brown and Nick Smith signing the accord in 2013. Um, I should say that there were special housing areas declared around Wellington, perhaps most famously down the road in Island Bay and Erskine College. Um, by June 2017, there are a total of um, 3,157 dwellings of 39,000 had been completed. Um, part of that was the time due to the time lag between resource consent and, um, and completion. Um, of these, some um, um, 580 were classified as affordable. Um, there's various definitions of affordable, um, but they're around about um, six to 700,000. Uh, close to 500 of these were social housing, and in fact, only 98 were market homes. So despite all those fast-tracking provisions, um, the private enterprise hadn't delivered the number of affordable homes that the government had hoped. Um, really, it didn't make sense for them um, to build um, affordable housing because of the cost of the land, because um, uh, um, the, 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 in terms of the profit that they could make on larger houses were, was far greater. It was a marginal proposition for developers. Um, now, the government did have the option of using the Public Works Act to buy land, um, but they refused to use it and remained adamant that increasing housing supply would um, solve the, pro um, the problem. I, I just wanted to put that slide on the right. It's a bit hard to see, but um, in 1936, the Labour government proclaimed basically the whole of the lower, lower, lower hut is a housing area under the Public Works Act um, to build state houses. So this idea that, um, which is where it's often seen as, as, as um, as something that can't be challenged um, about using the Public Works Act for housing. Um, past governments have used it constantly, um, and that's just an example here in Wellington. <clears throat> 
Well, in 2016, the public mood turned against the government's housing policies. Um, wheels had begun to fall off the, the previous year in 2015, when the Salvation Army de um, declined to join the competitive social housing market. Um, Bill English especially had seen the Salvation Army as a sort of um, a, poster, a poster child almost for what um, the competitive social, market, competitive social housing market could be. Um, that they would then buy up state houses and become providers themselves. Um, but when, as I understand it, um, when the Salvation looked into it, they found that they couldn't actually make it work for them. They didn't have the resources or the skills, um, and so they withdrew from it. Um, in May 2016, a proposal to sell close to um, 350 Invercargill state houses fell through. In August, there was a buyer found for some Tauranga state houses. Um, but then um, a sale of um, houses and state houses in Hora Whanua fell through. Um, <clears throat> so in November, Bill English announced the sale of nearly a third of all Christchurch state houses. He made the argument that these were aging and needed repair and the state wasn't the, um, there wasn't the organisation to do it. Um, he said famously that the state's just not that good at property development. Um, but again, no buyers found. And um, this is where John Key grew up in um, Christchurch. And um, John Key said he was pleased to see his house sold um, because somebody else could live in it um, and enjoy um, some of the similar experiences that he had growing up there. So um, he was very keen. Mm. Mm. Uh, just moving along. Oh, it stalled on me. I'll just use that. Here we go. Um, the other thing that was happening in 2016 is that housing, housing was becoming even more unaffordable. And in the middle of um, 2016, the IMF reported that New Zealand house prices were per um, relative income were the world's highest. Um, this is particularly the case in Auckland and Queenstown, um, where it was taking 10, uh, 10 times the median household income. And if you remember that the um, ideal is three times um, the median income, uh, that's just, um, and only a few years ago, it was six times, that's, that's just um, skyrocketed out. Um, the report attributed it to um, high population growth, particularly in Auckland, um, high rates of immigration, most immigrants coming to New Zealand were settling in Auckland. Um, that was increasing the chronic housing shortage supply, and also because of rising investor demand for um, rental homes. So in that year, something like 41% of all houses that were sold in Auckland were to investors. Um, by comparison, only 20% went to first home buyers. Well, the government was very much stuck between a rock and a hard place at this point because um, investors was a natural constituency for the government. They normally supported national governments. Um, but then it had its property owning democracy ideal of, of trying to get first home buyers, or young, young people between 20 and 40 buying their own home. Um, and this led Nick Smith famously to clear um, nonsensically really that um, he wanted house prices to continue to rise but only in single figures. Um, and um, this led to Fran O'Sullivan who's hardly a, um, a radical in terms of business commentators to say um, in the New Zealand Herald, it's a pretty crap society that denies home ownership to younger people or those less well off to reserve existing homeowners a new unearned wealth. Um, and she also went on to say, well, why isn't the government bringing in a capital gains tax? Why isn't it using the Public Works Act and, um, uh, and, and so on? Um, which, you know, for a conservative commentator was um, quite radical. Um, well, the government's reluctance to intervene in the market had led the Reserve Bank um, a few years before to intervene and bring in um, loan-to-value ratios, or LVRs. Um, and this increased the deposit of prospective homeowner needed to secure a mortgage. So, um, whereas um, earlier, you know, you might need only a 5 or 10% deposit for a homeowner, um, they brought in 20%. Um, they saw rising house prices as a real threat to the New Zealand economy, because if the housing market crashed, that could lead to um, further economic consequences for New Zealand. And so, even though the government wasn't willing to intervene, the Reserve Bank um, felt it had to, which is... Um, Pretty unusual in the history of New Zealand. Um, and it did um, eventually have an effect. The other thing that happened in 2016 was the winter of discontent. Um, the lack of affordable um, rental accommodation in cities was increasing housing insecurity. 
homelessness and associated poverty. You've got media images of people in the middle of winter living in cars or in garages or even tents um, that um, led to the allegations or that um, the government was uncaring and losing control of issues. Um, a lot of the media concentrated on the fact um, the government's ineffectiveness in dealing with it contrasted the way that Te Puya and other marae in Auckland opened their doors and, and brought in homelessness people. Um, and this is um, a Sharon Murdoch, <laughs> Murdoch cartoon um, at the top. Um, and then an unidentified man and his children at um, Te Puya Marae. Um, the other thing that um, was getting on people's wick was National's incessant denial that there's no housing crisis. Um, it just didn't ring true anymore. <laughs> So at the end of 2016, um, John Key resigned, was replaced by Bill English. Nick Smith was replaced by Amy Adams. And Amy Adams was um, a lot more um, pragmatic than Nick Smith had been. Um, Nick Smith was very much the idea that the market would deliver. Amy Adams um, was questioning that. In 2017, in March 2017, opinion polls showed that most New Zealanders believed there was a housing crisis and the housing was emerging as a key election issue which in terms of New Zealand elections is really unusual. And you can see that um, the graph from a Roy Morgan poll in, um, uh, in March 2017 showing that housing was um, uh, the key issue in, in January 2017. In, uh, January 2017. Um, in April, <coughs> um, realising that they're, they're really very much on the back foot, the Nats um, changed direction and announced the Crown Building Project in Auckland. So this would see some 8,300 8, Crown Oden Auckland homes replaced with 34,000 dwellings using that mixed tenure model. Um, housing New Zealand would build most of them um, under its Auckland housing program. Um, uh, and Amy, Amy Adams proudly announced that this was going to be the biggest um, building project since the 1950s, um, well, since the national, former national government had, um, under that group building scheme, um, built um, houses for, for rental and for sale. So in some ways, National was returning to its roots. 2017 election um, came by. One commentator praised the government's more pragmatic um, approach to the housing crisis, but basically said it was too little too late. Um, and that was uh, other commentators saying too. I mean, Matt had come into power in 2008 saying, um, that they would increase housing supply, they would make my houses more affordable, um, but the opposite had happened. Um, and also had failed to increase the rate of home ownership. Um, this had fallen from 68% in terms of total national um, rate down to 65% and declining still further. So really on its own terms, it had failed to, to, fail to, to deliver. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, right-wing think tanks, it wasn't just the lefties were saying that they're failing the New Zealand initiative. Um, you know, it found that under national homeowners have become far richer um, and renters far poorer. So they were saying, well, the inequality crisis that was occurring in New Zealand at this time was very much a housing crisis. So um, one inclusion I made that if housing problems did not cost national the election, um, it would have been in a better position to win if it had overcome more of them. And I don't often agree with um, Tremaine's cartoons, but this seems, um, uh, <laughs> it seems apt. Um, so what went wrong? <clears throat> um, as an historian, um, I'm always a bit um, tentative about um, um, making conclusions, um, we like to say that we need some critical distance to, to and analyse this. But I think having looked at this over um, earlier this year, I've, I've come to three main conclusions which we can perhaps discuss afterwards. Um, and the first was that really the National failed to recognise the growing scale of the housing crisis. Um, really for too long it was content to let homeowners sort of bask in the glory of, or warmth of um, rising house prices. And it really only acknowledged the detrimental impacts of rapid um, house price inflation when the Reserve Bank was forced to intervene with the LVRs in 2013. And again, it really only appreciated the growing um, homelessness problem during that 2016 winter of discontent. The second thing is that I think National put too much weight on supply side solutions to um, the housing problems. It's belief that reforming plan laws, um, cutting red tape, um, would turbocharge affordable housing, um, as John Key said, was really too optimistic. 
Arguably, it would have it worked in Landrich um, Christchurch. Um, Christchurch, as many would be familiar, has basically farms all around it. It can spread um, out almost endlessly. Um, it has a population which isn't growing. Um, it's fairly stable. Um, and so in Christchurch, the market solution worked. Um, the market did provide. But in Auckland, which um, has confined, very much a confined city, um, its population was skyrocketing. Um, it wasn't going to work. And so the, also the government's reluctance to dampen demand, like you know, putting constraints on immigration or putting in uh, capital gains tax, um, exacerbated the problem. And then finally, three, National um, had a misplaced ideological belief that the state should retreat from the housing market. So this informed its competitive housing market model and also its mixed tenure model. Um, the general success in the later um, led it to have a change of heart about um, the state's ability to build affordable housing, and this led into the 2017 Crown Building Project. Um, and I think if it had realised this sooner, it could have made more headway solving the whole housing crisis that John Key had identified um, earlier in 2007. So just in the words of, of final words of conclusion, <laughs> Nat's left office with um, ever more New Zealanders renting their houses and excluded from that Kiwi dream of home ownership. So for a party that always championed New Zealand as a property owning democracy, I think it is a lamentable legacy. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very illuminating discussion. It certainly made me remember things I'd forgotten about. Um, there were one or two factors that I thought you could have added in. Um, one was that I don't think the national government understood the implications of the global financial crisis and the collapse of um, the finance companies and hence the cutting out of a lot of the funding that had previously gone to um, housing developers. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and they also, I don't think, understood the implications of lower interest rates on inflating housing prices. Mm. Uh, so those a couple of things. And also I think they got tripped up by the size of the, the net immigration in surge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it meant that the population was growing faster than the yep. building industry could cope. So I think yep. a whole lot of things made it even worse than their ideological stance sure. uh, trapped them into. Yep, yep, no, that, that's helpful, thank you. Could I ask a question? Yes, Sarah. <laughs> um, do you think that without the housing, uh, sorry, without the food um, financial crisis, that the rising population was such that the, the, um, the building industry simply wasn't going to be able to keep up anyway, even if we hadn't had the added low interest rates? Um, I, I think that that was the case, and um, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think what really needed to happen was probably the previous Labour government should have acted sooner as well. Um, it, you know, the, the, there was certainly a housing crisis in the early 2000s, and I think if they had invested more in terms of trade training and those sorts of things, um, that would have helped in terms of the 2010s for sure, yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, sorry. sorry, my question was why do New Zealand house builders build fewer houses per year in comparison to those overseas, as you mentioned? Um, I think it's a really complex issue, but I mean, it, and people can contribute as well. But as I understand it, it's very much the case that they don't have the economies of scale. Like um, most house builders are sort of maybe one or two or three um, people as part of a team. Overseas, they're often large companies with many people involved. Um, they also um, are often individually designed, um, which makes it um, longer and more expensive to build. So whereas with prefabricated build, um, building, which is often done at a factory, um, it's often shipped on site and assembled on site. Um, 
builders in New Zealand start from the beginning of the foundations and then they wrecked everything in terms of frame and, and those things by hand. So that increase, increases both the time and the cost of building. So, and the fact that it's individually designed, again, means that you don't have those economies of scale. So that was one of the things that the Productivity Commission that I talked about identified in that um, 20, um, 2012 report. Um, and this present government is trying to, as many of you be aware, of trying to look at ways of increasing that productivity and having more um, uh, prefabricated homes um, to increase affordable supply as well. Yeah, so traditionally it's been the case that, that builders would build, you know, um, you know, maybe one or two buildings in a street, one or two houses in a street, or three houses in a street, um, rather than suburbs at a time, for example. Um, and because, um, that took a long time, you, it was, it's more, more sort of incremental in terms of development. Whereas um, a prefabricated um, builder would go in and build streets at a time, often. So. Um, hi Ben, thank you yeah. for your talk, it's very, yeah. very interesting. Um, and looking back, yeah, it's kind of like a slow train crash really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you've got any comments on the different roles of local and central government and how much that sort of played um, a part in, in what happened. Yeah, um, well, I sort of alluded to attention with the unitary plan with Auckland City and the government. Um, you know, there was a, in the draft unitary plan um, from 2009 or 10, I think, there was very much this idea that um, we wanted to build a sustainable and consolidated city. Um, there are areas marked out in central Auckland where um, there was thought that um, there could be um, rebuilding on brownfield sites. Um, uh, the government was opposed to that, very much so, and said, well, this isn't part of the New Zealand dream. Um, New Zealand dream is to have a quarter acre, you know, have all over paradise thing, the thing that Austin Mitchell referred to. You know, your own standalone house in a section. Nobody wants to live in apartments. Um, and so that brought up attention of the council and the government. Um, and when the final unitary plan was um, came together, uh, that urban consolidation thing was a much smaller component of it. Um, so there was a tension there. Um, Auckland and places like Wellington um, too, um, there's sort of some tensions in terms of sort of similar issues, but, um, but it would be an area to, to, to delve into more deeply too. Tony? <laughs> yeah, great talk. Um, I'd like to speculate and ask for your opinion on the yeah. inequality yeah. aspect. And I'll use my experience, I go backwards and forth to Melbourne quite a bit, and there's yep. a lot of high, medium and high density being built on the main arterial routes along the tram routes and in yep. the CBD. Yep. That's great. But that's where the increased supply is of lower cost housing that people move into who won't get the capital gain because the supply is increasing. Meanwhile, on the just one block in from the arterial routes are the one or two acre sections with the already four million dollar houses which are probably going to double in price because they're going to become scarcer and I worry about how we actually if we solve for people being able to afford to buy their housing it may not actually address the inequality because the housing that we're providing as a solution won't get the capital gains and if you just smack on a capital gains tax yeah. then that will evenly hit everybody. It's going to need something like a land tax or something like that. Any comments you have on that or anybody else in the audience? Because I think that's the next problem coming once we've sorted out the provision yeah. of medium density housing. Yep. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that the land tax would, would be the way to go. I mean, one of the things that happened in Auckland is that, um, <clears throat> you, know, you know, places like Ponsonby and, and um and uh, Graylin and so on, they were sort of identified as areas where there could be brownfield redevelopment because younger New Zealanders um, had, um, oh, what's that youth network in Auckland, Generation Zero, is that right? I think so. Um, they put in saying, well, um, we're being forced out to the periphery. Um, we want to live in the city. We don't mind living in apartments, um, you know, well-designed apartments with community facilities and so on. Uh, but the people living in, in Grey Lynn and um, Ponsonby and others said, well, there's no way this is going to happen. We want our um, colonial villas. Thank you very much. And 
long and the short story said that they, because they were politically powerful, they um, managed to get the council to back down from those sorts of things. Um, as you said, there are um, new developments going, planned for arterial routes and so on, but it is a, it is a real issue, I, I agree, about inequality because, um, you know, the people that are living on these you know, quarter or even eight acre sections, they're gonna make huge capital gains. Those living in the apartments or renting apartments more likely um, don't share in that, that, that um, unearned increment basically. Um, so um, I, I agree things like a land tax is, is, is probably the way to go. But okay, others, well, others might have a view. <laughs> uh, one last quick question from Helen. Mm. Well, I'm not sure this is a quick question, but <laughs> well, you offhand, to be afterwards, then. Do you want to offhand make how much of the last century do you think there hasn't been a housing crisis in New Zealand? Because I would vaguely estimate from the 1970 to 1990, but all the rest of it, there's been one housing crisis or another, and it's really part of a longer train wreck, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Our, our housing crisis started in 1840, really, and it's um, <laughs> and it's kind of continued on and off since then. It, it, it's something that we haven't managed to solve, really. You know, I'm just reading as part of the eviction project, um, people being evicted um, in the in the 1930s depression. Um, they're evicted. The houses lie empty. You know, and there's all these houses in Auckland lying empty. Um, and so again, it goes back to that, that um, inequality thing. So yeah, I, I, do, I do think we need to think of more imaginative solutions to, to solving it, but, but you're right, we've been, there's always been a housing crisis in New Zealand. Okay, well, thank you very much for finishing on that um, point. Sorry, I should be more uplifting. About the <laughs> it will be solved. <laughs> the tensions of New Zealand society and what kind of culture and we are and what we want to become in all kinds of ways, much more than just housing. Yeah. Um, let's thank Ben. Thank you very much for coming.